Michael Boyles, strengthcoach.com presents the Strength Coach Podcast, brought to you by Perform Better, the experts in functional training and rehabilitation, performbetter.com. All right, hey everybody, welcome to episode 269 of the Strength Coach Podcast, the official podcast of Michael Boyles, strengthcoach.com, the world's best source for strength and conditioning information, brought to you by Perform Better, the experts in functional training and rehabilitation, performbetter.com. I'm your host, Anthony Rando. The show notes are located at continuefit.com. That's my site. It's where you can find out all of my other resources as well as about my book, Be Like the Best and the Be Like the Best Workbook. The book consists of 50 interviews with top fitness pros. And after each interview is a Be Like, which is just an action step or a challenge that'll help you be like the best. The workbook actually has room for notes and places where you can just kind of answer the questions that we do in all the B-Likes. It's just a collection of all 50 B-Likes with the room for notes. And you can go to continuefit.com to get all the information on that. All right, today on the Coach's Corner with Coach Boyle, I spoke to him about coaching and culture in service he did on Body by Boyle Online. And as well as an upcoming article he has out, If I Was Back in Football, Strength and Conditioning, kind of lays out some stuff that he would, uh, what he would do now if he was going back into football. For the results, Fitness University Business of Fitness segment, I'm on with Elias Scar again to continue and finish up his series on sales. Today we talk about how does a small operator, somebody with one or two or even no staff, handle all of the procedures that we've been talking about. For the functional movement system segment, Jenna Gorlay is back on. She's going to start a two-part series on using the FMS with younger clients. For the train heroic data-driven coaching segment, Adam Doughty talks to Tim Robinson about rest, fatigue, and you. Remember, check out trainheroic.com to start your free 14-day trial. Let them know I sent you. You'll save 10% off your first year of the Train Heroic Pro or Elite Edition. For the Body Bible online.com, hit the gym with a train coach segment. I have on Krista Scott Dixon. She's the director of curriculum at Precision Nutrition. Good timing here with Thanksgiving. Um, she's also the author of Why Me Want Eat and Fuck Calories. Now, we talk all about awareness when we're eating, learning to trust your body and how you're feeling while you're eating. Also, how, how you eat trumps what you eat why you should really, 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 really slow down when you're eating, Uh, her books, Fuck Calories, and Why Me Want to Eat, and so much more. We talked about so many different things, used me almost like as a case study as well, because I've been going through her books, so um, great stuff coming up from Krista. Lots of things to get to, so let's get on the phone with Coach Boyle. All right, now it's time for the strengthcoach.com, Coach's Corner with Coach Boyle. Strengthcoach.com, the world's best source for strength and conditioning information. You can try it out for three days just to buck. You have access to all the articles, videos, and programs, as well as the best forum on the net. It's the only place to have full access to Coach Boyle. He's on every day answering questions. Sometimes those answers turn into articles, which uh, we're going to talk about in a minute. Uh, Coach, how you doing? I'm doing great, Ian. How are you? All right, I'm hanging in. Um, I want to go over that, actually. You know, you, somebody had, they, they named the thread the death of the barbell back squat, but really it was about kind of this idea of he, he's, he doesn't do back squats anymore, and he's a high school coach, strength and conditioning coach, and he wants to kind of talk to his coaches about, look, we don't do this anymore, and, and you really wanted to know what, what the approach was, and you literally kind of came up with an article, whether you knew it or not, wh- when you wrote your answer. Talk to us about this idea that the one thing you would emphasize first. Yeah, well, it, it's really funny because it, you picked up on that, and I just sort of wrote what I was, you know, what I would be thinking, okay, if I was back in the football world, what would I be doing? And obviously that's what you uh, titled the suggested article, but it would be that idea of trying to sell to the football coach. Okay. Why are we doing this? Why did we make this change? Why are we, you know, why are we going in this unilateral direction? Because, and I said this in the answer, you know, we still clean, we still deadlift, we still bench press. There's a lot of somebody watched our program from when they played at BU in the nineties. 
the thing that would stick out to them was no back squat. So you've got to kind of sell that change to your football coach because that's the hardest thing. I think that's the big stumbling block. If you said to people, we're not going to deadlift, we're not going to clean, people might be okay. If you said, you know, when you say we're not going to bench press or we're not going to squat, that's where people, you know, football people start really looking at you and thinking, wait a second, you know, you're not a real strength coach. You don't know what you're doing. So, yeah, I'm, I'm glad that you kind of picked up on that because I just wrote it kind of off the top of my head, not even thinking that it was kind of article worthy. And then you pulled it out and said, hey, this could be an article. And I read it and I thought, you're right. Well, I would also, I like the, sh- the, the way you really, uh, you know, there's this, this concept of the gap and the gain, right? So if you have 100%, you know, a goal, would your goal represents 100%. Let's say in, in, in three months, you get to 80%. So many times, this is a Dan Sullivan concept, by the way, it, so many times we focus on that gap. We got to 80%, but we just freak out over the 20% and we're focused on that. Meanwhile, we're not celebrating the 80% that we did get to. And this kind of reminds me of like, like what you talked about was like, don't focus on that one thing. We're still doing, we're still going to bench press and and hang clean, like you said. And then like, we're going to discuss specificity and injury prevention. We're going to discuss specific football techniques, like how linemen are taught to step and emphasize the unilateral nature of those skills. Um, and then we're going to emphasize the deadlift over the squat. So you're, you're still talking about, hey, this is, you know, better body position. We're still going to get you strong. We're going to get you strong grip. I love the way, you know, you kind of organized all of these positives to kind of to back your, you know, your, your claim in court. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, and that's because you realize that's what you're going to do because you're going to have to go and effectively argue with someone who's got a very, very prong, uh, strong predisposition towards something. And so if you don't kind of put all that stuff down and say, hey, here's all the areas, like you said, here's all the areas we're similar. Here's, you know, because if I went to somebody and said, hey, here's the one thing I want to do differently in our football program. Will you let me do one thing different? I think if you approached it that way, the football coach might look and think, okay, do I really want to fight with this guy over how we you know how we're going to squat one leg or two because that's really what it comes down to all the arguing that we do comes down to this idea of do we want to squat on one leg do we want to squat on two legs all the rest of it is remarkably similar and simple looking forward to uh the final product of that article let's get that going all right <laughs> um coach you actually we just posted on body by Bow online a coaching and culture in service and um, it was inspired by Bobby Smith from Ripped, uh, Reach Your Potential Training in New Jersey. We did a Strength Coach TV there, as a matter of fact. Bobby is such a high-energy guy. He came in, and um, I want to talk about this because there are some, you know, caveats to it. And you did mention it in the uh, – I didn't see the whole presentation, but saw a good part of it. Talk to us about your coaching and culture and service, some of the important parts of it. Well, did you see Bobby's in service the week before that, or are they, did they not post them in they, order? They, did did you post, they posted Bobby? that as well. Yeah, okay, they, all right, yeah. so you did. All right, so so basically, Bobby came in, and you know Bobby. Bobby's hair on fire, you know, clapping, jumping. He's unbelievable. And so everybody's reaction afterwards was, what did you think? And I thought rather than have 20 individual staff conversations with what I thought, because I had a lot of thoughts about, about Bobby and about what we could do differently and about culture. I said, Hey, I'm going to make this into a presentation. And so I started kind of pulling all my thoughts together. And so I started with the idea of, you know, uh, I sort of stole the Nike logo, be like Mike. And I put a big X through it in terms of now that's, and I tried to get them to understand, you don't want to be like me because I'm kind of, uh, I'm a lower energy guy. I am definitely not like Bobby. And I've been very successful with a different sort of coaching style. But when I look at Bobby's, I think I find Bobby's style or some of the things about Bobby's style really desirable. And I think, hey, I'd love to have a couple of people that are more like Bobby. So obviously I put up a, you know, be like Bob and then a video of Bobby kind of, you know, coaching some lateral movement and, you know, clapping and pointing. And and then I had actually, I put up Nicole Rodriguez 
and I put up a slider, you know, be like Nicole, because I felt like Nicole really represents the probably the midline between me and Bobby in terms of she's not hair on fire jumping around. She's not particularly loud, but she has a really authoritative voice. She demos extremely, extremely well. And in the, one of the points I made in the intro is, is she's talking to the athletes while she's demonstrating. So there's never that kind of dull moment of somebody lecturing to you. She does a really good job of combining. I'm giving you an amazingly good demonstration. While I'm doing that, I'm talking to you about it. And I think it makes it almost like I look, I hate to say that Nicole's the perfect coach, but she's pretty damn near for my taste in terms of, you know, and, and, no, and I said that Nicole's one of those people that I remember the first time Mark Verstegen saw her coach, she walked in the gym, he watched her for about five minutes. He's like, who's that? And I looked at him, I said, that's Nicole. And she's not going to work for athletes performance. So don't even ask her. Okay. And he just started laughing because I knew what he was thinking. He was like, wow, she's really, really good. And I was like, yep, she is. She's really, really good. She has like the right voice tone. And the demonstrations are perfect. So it was about that and sort of kind of how we can improve our culture without changing our culture and how yeah. we can be our best version, our authentic self. Because, you know, if I look at like someone like me or, you know, Dan McGinley or some of the guys that work uh, at MBSC, they'd be faking it in the be like Bob mode. But at the same time, I look and think they wouldn't be faking it in the be like the Cole mode. So we've got to be able to look at that and think, hey, I got to, you know, I've got to show them kind of a little bit of this continuum. And then we just talked about how the difference is like, you know, Bobby style wouldn't do as well with adults. And, you know, the, you know, like, like blowing a whistle and jumping around and clapping your hands. You know, some of the adults would just be like, oh, I, you know, this is, I can't do this at the end of the day at work. Yeah, I can't yeah, have somebody yeah. jump, jumping around like this. And so trying to talk too about the idea that we've got to develop the ability at MBSC to kind of turn this stuff off and on a little bit and, and be able to sort of, all right, I, you know, I got a middle school group. I got to ramp it up a little bit. I've got an adult group. I've got to tone it down a little bit. I've got a high school group. I've got to hit maybe that middle ground a little bit. And so I thought, I just thought it was a really good Bobby came in and one did just a kick-ass in service anyway, just the, you know, everything that he did was great. But then he also presented us a really good teachable moment that I wanted to take advantage of the next week, which is what we did. Yeah. It, going back to Nicole, even you're right. She, you know, it's funny because you have Dan John at the MBSC winter summer uh, seminar this year in February, and he's coming back. And the first time, one of your first winter seminars was with Dan John. And yep. um, so I saw Nicole coach, even though I knew her like through, you know, summits and et cetera, I saw her coach for the first time and I pulled her aside and I said, Oh my God, Nicole, I just have to tell you, this is amazing coaching. And, and I, I think what you should really do is you should meet Nick Winkleman because she literally was the female version of Nick Winkleman to me. And I, cause Nick Winkleman. Okay. Is so a, you're, so you're to blame. Yes. Uh, okay. no, but, now but I know that, that that's good. I'm glad you owned up to that. I, I, sh no? I didn't really have to. It's just that you have a bad memory because you're old. <laughs> because I did say that. I said, you need to go check out Athletes Performance to learn. And what, and then you could bring it back to MBSC a little bit. No. And so I called Nick and I said, Nick, wow, you got to meet this girl. She's like literally like you. And then you text me because her and Kyle, they wanted to go down to the Athletes Performance Mentorship. And you asked me if... Um, you said, Ant, are they going to, you know, should I send them? Are they going to get something out of it? And she, and that's when Mark called you after that mentorship and said, Mike, uh, yeah, I know what you're calling for, Mark. Um, yeah. But but you're right. She has this, I love this idea, uh, you know, don't look in my, you know, in, uh, the man in the window, right? You can look in and yeah. you could see Nicole. She's such a great coach. And, but she, you have to, the important piece here is that you have to be authentic to yourself. Like, like you said, right. you can't, you'll know you're faking it, but there are ways to amp up that atmosphere too. I know when I, when I worked in the bar business, I worked for a guy named Randy Gerber and it's, he's a celebrity. He's married to Cindy Crawford. And so like, we always had celebrities in there, but the guy, I don't know how much he knew about the bar business, to be honest with you, but he knew about atmosphere and, and creating an environment like we had certain times we had to slowly turn up the lights from between five and 10. It got darker as we went. The music, 
he had a thing. You literally had to say, if you can hear other, I, you want to be able to hear a conversation in your group but you don't want to hear other people's conversations. So that's how you had to judge how high the music went. And then there was temperature. So there was there was lighting, conver- you know, music, and temperature. Those were the three main things that they really wanted the manager to manage. And you were kind of talking about that with music as well. So there's other ways to kind of amp up that, that atmosphere as well. Yes, there's no question. And that's where, and I guess it's always that way with like trying to get everybody to kind of understand the art of coaching part of this whole thing is really, really interesting because you, you look at it and think there are so many people who are so fascinated by the science of coaching. And I'm not that, I think the science of coaching is pretty simple to be honest, but I think the art of coaching is incredibly complex in terms of that ability, as you said, to kind of, you know, to manage the room, to figure out like, and I talked, I gave the, uh, the example, and I actually, I think I dropped an F-bomb, unfortunately, in there, but <laughs> with the um, hockey guys, you know, I said, if you, you came out with that football kind of rah-rah, you know, blowing a whistle, jumping around, the football guys, well, the hockey guys would just look at me, like, they'd look at me if, say, Vinny was coaching that way, and they would literally be like, what's up with Vinny? You know, can you get him a, can you get him to tone it down a bit? Yeah. And whereas yeah. football guys, are expecting that that's what you know they expect to see you know unfortunately the guy we talk about you know now they like they're looking for the sideline clown who's dancing and you know wearing his you know cutting sleeves off his shirt and all that stuff and so you got to be able to know who are you in terms of you know what is going to be like what's the limit of my personality i can remember seeing this years ago and i won't mention the names but we had a football coach who at one point had worked for Bill Parcells. And when he got his first head coaching job, he was like a little pretend Bill Parcells. And it was a miserable failure because the guys saw right through it in terms of they're like, you're not Bill Parcells. You're not even close to Bill Parcells. So don't be giving us, you know, the Bill Parcells swagger that was developed sort of over, you know, over numerous Super Bowls and championships. It's like, you know, you got to earn some of that swagger. And so I think there's that ability, like you can't look and think, you know, like I said, like, you know, if I'm Benny or Dan or whoever, and they come out and suddenly realize, hey, I'm going to be Bobby Smith tomorrow, you know, and I'm going to, I'm going to get a whistle and I'm going to start yelling at everybody. People would be really put off by that because that's not authentically, genuinely you. But if you just kind of said, hey, I'm going to crank this up, you know, five or 10% from an energy and enthusiasm standpoint, and I'm going to make sure, like I said, like Nicole, I'm going to make sure, man, my demos are just freaking like dead on. I'm going to give them, because that's why I'm, I'm so big on that. Like, I want to see the best demonstration that you can give. I want the kids, and I say this all the time, I want the kids to be wowed by how athletic you are as a coach. I really do. And that's one of the things sometimes that our coaches end up kind of a little bit underselling and, you know, underwhelming the athletes. And then I always say to them, hey, you give an underwhelming demonstration, you get you get an underwhelming uh, you know, demonstration from the kids the same way because they give you right back. You know, if you give them, you know, we talked about, it's like, you know, I said, if you're playing, you know, you're the record on 78 RPMs or, you know, instead of, uh, you know, or I was playing on 33 instead of 78, you get 33 back. You know, you get like, yeah, mm, kind of thing. And, and the coaches sometimes don't realize that. And we've talked about, you know, our guys too, like it's long days. Bobby's thing is good because he's like we used to be. He's an athlete facility in the afternoon. It's really easy to kind of throw the energy up from three to six or three to seven and say, man, I'm going and I'm going hard. It's really hard to get in there at five 30 or six in the morning and still be there at six 30 at night and think, you know, I'm going to be, you know, house of fire here, ball energy. It's much more difficult in that particular situation. So there's a lot to it. I just think, but it was a tremendous opportunity for us to, um, so two opportunities to learn as a staff, one obviously from Bobby and then one for me to kind of be able to give them my interpretation of that. Yeah, absolutely. And I like that you were like, look, don't be like Mike, you know, and you were stealing that not from Michael Jordan, but from be like the best. There's the shameless plug. Um, oh, there you go. You're right. I met you. I did realize I should have. I did. <laughs> I did have that thought um, first. But, but um, 
No, no, but I like, like that. Anthony. Yeah. But, you know, and that's honestly like in the book, like why do we, there's no science in any of the B likes. It's all about building relationships, developing yourself, right? Uh, look at your B like, like, you know, was about, was had nothing to do with strength and conditioning, was about, hey, go out and speak, go out and, and lecture, start to do that, that type of stuff, right? writing articles. And, you know, we talk about like Bill Parisi engaging people more. So there's ways within, you know, making sure you're saying hi to everybody that walks in, especially, you know, spending that, that couple of minutes. My famous, my favorite quote from that I got from you, I know you didn't invent it, but nobody cares how much you know till they know how much you care. And those, there's so many little things that you can do to show them that you care that will also amp up the session and get them engaged a little bit more as well. So I think that's part of it. Yeah, no, and you're right. And then, like I said, you made the music part, like remind, like you said, and I said that to them, sometimes you have the music loud enough for the first group. And then by the time you get four groups in there, I can't tell if the music's on or not. And it's like, you know, and, and Bobby made that point. You, know, you want the music bumping. And I was like, yeah, you're right. But you know, you not, you know, you don't want someone to be in there, you know, going deaf. So it's almost like you know, you've got to be turning that dial up and you've got to be turning your own dial up a little bit too, in terms of, you know, at different times during the day, you know, I, I like that idea of, you know, it's like, you got to have a volume switch to some degree and realize, all right, I need to, I got, you know, I got an, a group that needs energy. I got to bring a little bit more. I got a group that needs less. You know, I got middle school kids. Sometimes it's like, you got to tone it down and get them, you know, you've got to control their energy. So it's, it is, it's, I mean, it's art of coaching. Yeah, absolutely. All right, coach. Thank you so much for doing this. Thanks for uh, uh, all you do uh, this Thanksgiving week. We appreciate you and uh, we'll talk to you next time. Well, I appreciate you do way more for me than I do for you. So thank you. All right, right now at Perform Better, they got the huge holiday sale up to 30% off so many items, free shipping on select items as well. They got sandbags on sale, FMS kits, TRXs, all kinds of rollers, kettlebells, and dumbbells. Check out that huge holiday sale. Also, the one-day seminar dates have been announced. They're kicking it off in January uh, on January 11th in Fairlawn, New Jersey, with uh, stops in San Francisco, LA, Austin, Orlando, Boston, and Chicago. You can check out performbetter.com for all their products and info on their educational seminars. Hey, this is Zap, and this is Tim. Welcome to the Train Pro Data Driven Coaching segment. Let's go. So uh, today, Tim, we're going to talk about why getting on the gram could be good for your gains. This is my absolute nightmare. I Tim's triggered. <laughs> I am really triggered. No. So, but really, we're going <laughs> yeah. to talk. Let's talk. Uh, let's talk fatigue. Okay. Right? First, let's start there, and we'll come back. Yeah, I like that. Well, right? we get a ton of questions about things like this, right? Whether it's fatigue or rest time, work to rest. I think we should simplify it for the people in listener land and just dive in a little bit so we have a base understanding of what's right. going on here. So we say fatigue, right? We hear a lot, like, the, you know, the most common, like, trope in, like, <laughs> lifting. is like, I did, you know, deads, yeah. and now my CNS is fried. I'm crushed. I can't lift anything. Yeah, yeah. And a hard day of deads is a hard day of training in general. Sure. So they're generally stressful, right? But when we talk about central fatigue, like okay. CNS fatigue, okay. right? Okay. You're actually talking about something that's more important, typically, on a shorter time frame. Right. Right. So we're talking more, you know, it actually builds up during the course of a training session, to some mm -hmm. degree, after you've done some volume of work. Sure. And then it dissipates shortly thereafter. This is kind right. of like the lactate thing. Like, oh, back in the day, it's like, oh, my, my lactic acid is yeah, high. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, right? Yeah, right. But it actually goes, it gets, you know, kind of washed out pretty quickly. Right. And what Adam's talking about with central fatigue is like fatigue that's not happening. Like what we would think in simplified layman terms for people like me is not like directly in the muscle, right? Or directly surrounding that muscle. It's more of like your ability to motivate and drive yourself to execute that motion. Sure. So that could yeah. be anything from like the brain to the motor neurons, anything sure. that basically tells the muscle to go. Yeah. Right. Okay. Uh, whereas there are process, there are things that happen in the muscle that also like the muscle intrinsically can get fatigued as well. Sure. Right. Things that happen to like the the motor units or the fibers themselves. Right. Okay. Not going down that path. Yeah. Let's yeah. not. Let's not. Yeah. Let's not try to describe that <laughs> on a five minute podcast. Yeah. That'll yeah. be no fun. Okay. <laughs> so, but you have this this central fatigue, CNS fatigue, that happens, and it builds up. Like I said, it's actually pretty easy to elicit. For example, by aerobic training. Okay. Right. And so you can imagine, like, even if you took like. Uh, an, an intensity that you could hypothetically do forever, right? Or okay. for a very long time, mm -hmm. right? And you were properly fueled and all that. It feels harder as time goes on. Yes. And at some point, you probably have to stop. 
right? right? It wasn't like fueling and your muscles actually didn't get damaged. And like it wasn't like oxygen supply that limited them. Okay. It was something else. And this is like where some of the central governor stuff comes from, right? Right. Well, if you think about it this way too, like you have ultra marathon runners running for like 72 hours straight, they're not going to be able to keep that up forever, right? They're going to stop, but it might not be because... Uh, their muscles are sore. You know what I mean? They're fueling their body appropriately. It might feel like forever. But, <laughs> yeah, it might, yeah, it might. But right, so basically what we're saying is that there's some of the thing, like, you know, as you do more sets of the same exercise, yeah. you accrue more fatigue, right? Okay. So like if we're going RPE, right, you hit triples in the first couple or at an RPE of nine, and then mm-hmm. like you do a couple more, and finally, like, oh, that's all I could do, even yeah. if you take long rest between them, right? Additionally, if you switch exercises, right? It's so like, okay. let's say I do my, my squats first, and then I want to do some chins afterward. Right. Would I perform as well on the chins if I do them second as if I did that order in reverse? I mean, no, you wouldn't, right? Pro- probably you'd, you'd not. F- you're, you'd feel tired. Right. Right. Your and body so would that, feel fatigued. This is just more evidence that, like, there's something other than, than what's going on in the muscle itself Got that it. causes us to basically not do as well. Yeah, it makes sense. Okay. okay. Let's bring this back to rest now. Okay. Right? This is the yes. topic that actually brought this kind of conversation. Yeah, this happens, all, every day we have this conversation. Right. So why do we rest? I mean, we all understand that to, to do, like, strength work and perform well— Right. Right. You got to have a few minutes of rest or maybe even more if you're really strong. Yeah. And we all have like a baseline of understanding about this. To me, like rest times and this sounds bad, but they're like relatively arbitrary. I'd give folks like a, OK, you get you know this much. This is your floor. But after that, when you feel good, that's kind of important. Then you can jump in and hit the next set right. or whatever it might be. So for performance and power, we get this. Yeah. But when you bring it back to like hypertrophy. Oh, no. We kind of get there's like mixed <laughs> ideas out there. And to be honest, okay. it's really complicated. Sure. And it's hard to prove anything. But, you know. If you asked 100 coaches, a good portion of them would probably say, well, there's, you know, there's probably evidence that shorter rest is better. I would agree. But I'm not sure that really plays out in real life, right? Got so it. of all the training studies out there, there's a couple that show that, like in some cases. But by and large, it actually looks like both like looking at protein synthesis and hypertrophy, actual training outcomes, right, uh-huh. that longer rest might be preferable. Oh, interesting. And so why would that be, right? Yeah. And I think it comes back largely again it's really complicated because you have a lot going on it sure. comes back probably to like this issue of like central fatigue yeah absolutely. that if you don't give it that time for this essential fatigue to dissipate right right then in each successive set you're just not able to drive the muscle as hard and Got so it. the perception of fatigue sets in but the the training result actually isn't the same Oh, okay. Yeah, I mean, that, that makes total sense. Obviously, different from the school of thought I came from, I was always thinking, like, short rest time for the curls, tear the muscle apart, build it back up. But that's an interesting way to put it. If you can't drive that work, it's not even going to be worth it in the, in, you know, at any time anyway. So if you're like Tim, <laughs> and you really care about your curls, maybe you ought to do those first. I'm going to give that a shot. And go on Instagram, go on Instagram between the sets so you rest longer. Everyone peep my Instagram. Here come bicep pics. <laughs> That's going to do it for us today. Go to trainhook.com to start your 14-day free trial. When you're talking to one of our representatives like Tim here, tell them that the Strength Coach Podcast sent you for 10% off a year of the Pro Elite Edition. All right, now it's time for the Results Fitness University Business of Fitness segment. I continue my series on sales with Elias Scar, Membership Director at Results Fitness University, uh, Results Fitness, and the Sales and Communication Coach at Results Fitness University. Elias, thanks so much for coming on again. For sure. All right, you know, I think, and I know this for a fact at, you know, Results Fitness University being part of the, the, uh, the, the coaching group there, there's, there's a lot of, people with, you know, really small operations. So whether it's themselves or, or two people or, you know, an owner, a trainer and and an assistant, a part-time assistant, what are kind of best practices? Because we talked last time about this idea about the strategy session. It's so important. It takes 45 minutes, possibly an hour. We do have people calling us with that sales over the phone. We talked about that a couple, like, a month and a half ago, a couple episodes ago. If if you're a small operation, can you give it? Because I know you get this question a lot. Can you give us kind of best practices how the small operation should set this whole thing up and maybe maybe take a little bit of time away from it? For sure. So as we talk about, like if you're if you're a one person show, um, it can feel like oh my gosh, uh, I I have to compete with all these other gyms that have all this staff and all these toys and a smoothie bar and all this kind of stuff. You really don't. If you sit there and remind yourself it is about building your relationships, then those are one-to-one. Every relationship starts one-to-one. So if it's just you, that's really 
all that you need. Everything else just makes you that little bit that that little bit better, allows you to do a little bit more. So for looking at it and you don't have time for like the full entry and a functional movement screen and a tour of your space, you might not even have a space. You might be coaching out of someone else's space and you can't set up a tour, whatever the case may be. Build that relationship with that intake form. That's the whole point. That's really what it comes down to is take the time to ask questions, get to know that person. You can really do that in about 30 minutes and get to find out what it is that is important to them, what it is that they're looking for, what their emotional anchor is to that thing. Why is this so important? And once we get that information, we can actually start to make, help them make buying decisions. So you don't have to have all the stuff. It's the same as like, you have good, good, good diet and exercise. You don't have to have supplements to make you better. But if you have them, they make you a little bit better, right? They're a supplement. They fill in the blanks. You have to look at everything else that way. We're constantly at Results Fitness. We're looking for what is 1% better. What's the one thing we can add or change that makes it 1% better? But it's already an 80% game yeah. where, it's, where it's knocking it out of the park. Yeah, and I think we, we talked about this last time, uh, you know, about the way I did it. And I sent them a, you know, a, a kind of like a survey monkey type thing with a bunch of questions. You can still like, kind of do a hybrid version. Send them some to get them out of the way. Make sure you review it before they come when the time is right for you. But then when they come in, boom, I always sat down with people for, you know, 10 or 15 minutes. Then I did an assessment um, or I gave them a tour first. Like I said last time, I, I mm-hmm. that's why I got a B minus from you. Um, <laughs> so, you know, I did the tour. I sat down with them. 10, 15 minutes I did, I always showed what I did again with my five iron was easy because not easy, but it was a, such a specific demographic. I would take a picture of their golf posture before the whole thing. I, as I was taking a tour, I would take a picture of your golf posture and then we would do the assessment. Then I would do a couple exercises and then I would have them in, and get them into better posture in one session. And they were sold on that. Uh, but there are things that, you know, you can do to kind of make it a little bit of hybrid, but I love this idea. Like you said about, it's really about building that relationship, building that rapport. Yeah. I mean, if I were to break it down, there isn't, there, there isn't a whole lot of, it, it, it can sound like there are a lot of things we do, but that's because we're going into detail. It really is just spending time with that person. And so when we talk about doing that intake, if you just, if you're just so short on time or you need to clip time, do less, don't do a tour, do a little bit less, right. And build up to, to what you, what you can do, what's reasonable. Now for me, when people are like, I I need to get these done in 20 minutes, I I like to be real honest with with those folks and say, 20 minutes is, is not a lot of time to tell somebody, I would like you to spend more than 10 grand with me over the next three years. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> right? Dedicate Good point. that time up front. Give first. Give your time. Give up front. That's how equity works. We want to build equity by giving, 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 giving up front. And the easiest thing for us to give that people are so desperate for that they don't get from other relationships in their lives is time because everyone's in a hurry. So for you to give someone that time sends a very, very specific message. And so I would definitely encourage people to find a way to make that happen, whether it's making it by appointment, whether it's meeting them at a coffee shop because you're renting space out of some big box and you can't do it when they want to do it. Go meet them somewhere else. You don't have to do a tour. Go meet them somewhere else. Go through the intake form, talk about them, have a nice casual conversation about somebody they want to do uh, business with. Absolutely. What would you feel about that part of it if they were coming in and you said, hey, I just wanted to talk to you for 10 or 15 minutes and you did some of the park you over the phone. If they, you know, again, we're talking about specific unique because somebody can do it at one o'clock and you're like, no, we're not here at one or et cetera, or I can't get down there. So can we do this over as part of it over the phone? How would you feel about that? You know what? I'm okay with doing it over the phone. I it's, first of all, I'm okay with doing it however way, as opposed to not doing it. Yeah. Right. Like if the, if the answer is, well, you can't make it a one. I'm only available at one, so see ya. No, that's always the wrong answer. So if it means we can do it over the phone or I can have a conversation over the phone, absolutely do that. I would just remind you, like everything else, practice. Practice talking on the phone. Practice communicating on the phone. Get good about conversation on the phone. Like, for example, even just doing the interview with you right now, you ask the right questions, you probe the conversation, you pay attention to where this conversation is going, you, you think about what I've already said, what I haven't said, what you know about me before. And so you have this tremendous amount of practice 
of getting information from somebody without being in front of them, which is exactly what you and me are doing now yes. because you've been doing it for so long. So just like anything else, it's a skill. Good point. Excellent point. Well, this has been an amazing series. We've done five episodes with Elias and, um, I hope you guys got as much out of it as I have. And if you want more information for each episode, we've been posting the video that the Strength Coach TV episode that I did with just Elias. And I kind of went through, we started outside, we sat down. We even had somebody cross, they were, they were worried that they were going to cross the camera. We're like, no, this is real time. Come on, bring it through. So it's a great, <laughs> it's a great episode to really, to, to put all these pieces together in one sitting. So Elias, thank you so much much for coming on for sure and and don't forget in case you didn't know seek me out on instagram i'm the only elias scar on instagram i'm easy to find and i absolutely answer all the dms that come my way so if you want to have a talk or want to chat shoot me a message very cool thanks again elias Welcome to the Functional Movement System segment. My name is Jenna Gourlay, and today I would like to start a two-part series about using the Functional Movement System with younger clients. One of the questions I get a lot is, is at what age do you start doing the FMS or the FCS? I love this question. I've screened all ages of kids from preschool to 12th grade, and now I'm not saying you need to or should screen four-year-olds, but if you aren't using the FMS or its principles with younger clients, then you're missing out on a lot. I know that I was initially... Uh, because a few years ago, we started small uh, performance group training, expecting to get mostly high school and college age clients. Well, that's what it was in the beginning. We started to get some younger and younger kids. You know, our intake testing looks at the FMS, the FCS, and sports-specific metrics. So when we started getting interest from these younger populations, we asked ourselves, you know, is 11 too young to screen? Is 9 too young to screen? Now, presently, the majority of our clients are somewhere between the ages of 9 and 14, and this is an awesome age group when it comes to using the FMS. I really want to tell you about one client in particular, Justin, because while his results aren't unique to him, his experience tells a great story about the impact that you can make using this system with younger clients. Now, Justin was 11 when he started training with us. He wanted to get more playing time in any one of his three sports, those being soccer, basketball, and baseball. And his parents, on the other hand, just wanted him to be more coordinated. They were quick to tell us at uh, intake that he lacked coordination. His mom, to put it in her words, said he falls all over the place, and we have no idea why. Uh, she was kind of a little apprehensive about us starting the intake testing. Now, as Justin went through the testing, he was quiet and he was doing it with another 13-year-old from a different school. He did everything we asked him to do, but you could tell that he was uncomfortable and he didn't really want to be there. I got my first experience with Justin, as his mom put it, falling all over the place when we tried to do the hurdle step, the inline lunge, and the motor control screen. When we then got to jumping, this became even more obvious. As we screamed, you could hear his parents yelling in the background, telling him to try and land his jumps. And he was rolling all over the floor so much that I was unsure if he even really understood what we meant when we told him to stick the landing. So a whole lot of extra reps later, we uh, got some clean data and we finally finished his intake. We sat down with his parents um, to talk about it, and now he had a screen that was full of ones except for symmetrical threes on shoulder mobility and a two on his right active straight leg raise. Everything else was a one. We also saw an asymmetry on his right leg compared to his left leg on the motor control screen, and both upper body and lower body distance on the motor control screen were below where we'd look for. He could not jump his height, and he had a big asymmetry between his left and his right leg when we compared them on his single leg broad jump. The problems in the FMS were echoed by his performance on the FCS and then also on those sports-specific metrics. So again, we finished testing, and we sit down with him and his parents uh, to discuss his results. The most obvious thing to anyone that was watching was how much he struggled with the jumping. It was the, the first thing that his parents asked about, and it was the thing that he said that he had the most difficulty with. But when we were going over the results, we didn't just discuss his jumping performance necessarily. Having his movement control results and his FMS results allowed us to actually give the why behind the difficulty he was having with jumping. Since Justin you know, had a poor landing technique when he was jumping, then we wanted to question whether or not he had the balance to actually stick the landing. He didn't based on the motor control data that we had. 
And since he didn't have good balance, then we want to question, you know, does he have the mobility to do it? If we go back to his active straight leg raise, we saw an asymmetry between his right and his left side. It doesn't make any sense to keep telling Justin to stick his landing because he doesn't have the balance or the mobility to do so. We're asking him to do this really coordinated jump without first having the fundamental pieces. I think this happens a lot with kids when they're told to do something, especially when they're trying to learn like a sports skill, where we tell them what to do, but they really either don't know what to do or they don't have the fundamental pieces. So now, while we know that we wanna work on developing his performance, that's why they're here, we know that we'll have to improve his mobility and his balance in order to improve his performance. So now, how does a quiet kid that can't balance on one foot and doesn't seem excited to go to training become a kid that jumps way farther than his height and refuses to stop coming even one year later when he had gotten the starting position on his baseball team? That's what we're gonna talk about in the next segment how we improved his movement, and also discuss what made his mom pull us aside to talk privately after his first retest. That's it for today. My name is Jenna Gourlay, and this has been a Functional Movement System segment. For more information, please check out functionalmovement.com, and thank you for listening. All right, now it's time for the Body by Boyle online.com. Hit the gym with the strength coach segment. Become an insider to Mike Boyle Strength and Conditioning with staff meetings, in-services, and complete access to the MBSC programs. All right, today I have on Krista Scott Dixon, KSD as she's known. She's the Director of Curriculum at Precision Nutrition. She has over 20 years of experience in adult education and curriculum design. So she's behind the PN Coaching Program Development. Once the kid picked last for every team it's why it's taken her so long to be on the strength coach podcast um, <laughs> she sees health and fitness as pathways to a bigger goal and changing people's lives she's the author of several books right now i'm in the middle of why me want eat and she has an ebook a free ebook on um on her website stumptious uh it's called fuck calories and it's really good it's really right to the point Highly recommended. It's free, so check that out, and I'll have links to that later. Um, so, Krista, thanks for doing this. Thank you so much for having me. I'm already smiling as you do this intro, so I'm I'm pretty sure we're going to have a fun time here. All right, very cool. Um, I want to talk about this idea. I what I loved about so far in, in why me want eat and fuck calories is really this idea of self awareness. And um, so I definitely want to get into that. We'll probably go into some of my issues. Um, but I think I, I'm always nervous with the nutrition interview because I feel like an idiot all the time with this stuff, right? Because I feel like I can never get it right. And then, you know, read it going through why me want eat. I, I start to, I, you know, I'm starting to feel better about myself because obviously these are problems that other people have this whole idea about kind of beating ourselves up over nutrition and not feeling in control. And I, I do think part of it is interestingly enough, last night I watched the game changers documentary and, and I think there's so much controversy over these things right now and in in fuck calories you were talking about you know you said everything we we know about nutrition is probably bullshit and and one of the things you talked about was published research and i think part of the problem is we we think okay i'm not going to listen to these guys or wow the game changers is, is uh they're 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 paid for by this one and and that's why i'm not going to listen to them but I, this research says but you're also even saying like obviously published research is, is there, there's a lot of flaws with that as well as like being behind the scenes paid for by the big, big pharma, et cetera. Talk to us about this idea about this idea about nutrition. All that we know is probably bullshit. We're getting fed a lot of um, stuff we shouldn't really be listening to. Yeah. I, I mean, and I think like in, in discussing this, I think we don't want to go down the path of a conspiracy theory, right? Because I think that would be people's like immediate instinct of like, oh my God, big food is after us and yeah. you know, big marshmallow wants us to consume their products. And I mean, that's really not the argument I'm making. I guess what I would do is I would sort of step back and you know, as a former university professor, look at the process of knowledge production, right? How do we know what we know or what we think we know, which I think is always a good question to ask ourselves is like, 
aware and thinking humans in the world, right? Mm -hmm. And so we actually have a, an article on our website at Precision Nutrition called Why Nutrition Science is So Confusing. And it talks about a lot of the issues in developing published research. So, I mean, I'll run through a few of them. Um, so there's there's kind of different points in the chain, too. So, so one point in the chain is I'm a researcher and I have conceptualized a research question and I need to not only get institutional approval for that, I also need to have the resources to investigate it and uh, I need to get money for that. Right. So right away, you have a series of potential uh, locks and gates that could be keeping you constrained from researching particular topics. So, for example, maybe your uh, university uh, you know, or lab that you're working in only does certain kinds of questions and not others. Maybe your funding comes from certain places, whether that's government or industry. Uh, maybe your colleagues are are not cool <laughs> with you going in one direction or another. Mm. Or maybe you get through all these gates and you run your experiments or you do your studies and you find out, meh, like it's it's not really that interesting or there are no results. And now you really kind of have something you can't publish. Even if you do have something you can publish, you know, uh, there may be certain trends in journals, again, gatekeepers at certain journals, uh, you know, so there's like all of these checkpoints for the ways in which nutrition research is produced before we even get to the quality of the research. And we've seen in, you know, recent years, a lot of issues with um, statistical quality, right? So very famous example would be Brian Wansink, the author of Mindless Eating, uh, James Heathers, for example, and his colleagues have called him out on like, you know, hazy statistical accuracy. And we're learning that a lot of these very uh, significant studies or, or domains of research are not repeatable, they don't replicate well, or there's been a ton of like statistical tap dancing that had to occur to get them to fit a conclusion. Uh, you know, so there's, there's that. And then you have other things like, how was the information gathered? And one of the most common ways is what's called a food frequency questionnaire, which is basically me saying, hey, listen, um, last year, how many times a week would you say that you ate fruit? And you're like, uh, I don't know, seven, 12, I don't know, right? So we know that a, a lot of these recall surveys are incredibly inaccurate, whether that's even yesterday. Like probably most of us could not create an accurate depiction of what we ate yesterday. So <laughs> Never mind, yeah. you know, we could go or a month ago. So, you know, like as you layer on these uh, sort of systemic problems, you start to see some real challenges. And then, of course, you get all the way to the end of the chain and you have reporting or interpretation. And a lot of the reporting is done by people with no scientific literacy uh, or, you know, they're journalists and they're trying to get like that story out in the next 24 hours. So they skim the abstract and they skim the title and they're like, oh, I don't know, uh, eating beans causes cancer. Boom, done. There's my story. Right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it has very little to do with the actual research or talking to the scientists or creating a nuanced perspective of what was studied. I mean, the actual study might even say the opposite of what's being reported, or it's like the study was actually cultured mouse cells in a Petri dish that were exposed to some chemical from the skin of beans. Like it's just so yeah. completely unrelated to what's discussed. And so again, all of these things together create a very confusing picture. Then on top of that, you slather this nice thick icing layer of shame and anxiety, right? So it's exactly as you say, you get to this end point where you're confused, you don't know what to believe and who to trust. And no matter what decision you make, you're going to feel anxious and guilty about it, right? So it's yeah. like, this, it's a very, very difficult situation. You know, and it's funny just to kind of go back to this idea about the game changers thing, right? Because that's a lot of times how so many people and really, Let's talk about our clients. Our clients are getting this. They're like, hey, Krista, I saw the game changers and I really I want to go plant based. Right. Because now and now. So it's it's important for us to understand some of this stuff. And what's really interesting is we had a thread on traincoach.com about somebody had mentioned the, the thing. OK, everybody, let's talk about it. You know, they opened it up and four people who talked about it didn't watch the documentary. <laughs> like that's how. I think that's classic. <laughs> yeah. And, and I think it also tells how much we we've also started to say, look, 
Don't watch these things. Before you. I even watch it, I can tell you what it's going to say, right? You know, because they're, 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 there's a similar message in a lot of them. Um, but I think what, what I sit down and I watch, watch those things, I, number one, I want to take the positive out of it, right? I want to, I want to say, what if this idea about eating a hamburger and clouding up my blood is, is, uh, um, and possibly clogging my arteries right away? Um, what if it is true? That, that's kind of how I try to approach it, number one. But also, I feel like even if I did, like you, t- you mentioned shame, if I did start this plant-based diet just off of the fact that I saw this documentary, I'd kind of feel a little like, I don't want to tell anybody that I'm doing this because, you know, I've been down a million roads before and and I feel funny that I'm trying this new thing that I don't really know a lot about, that I don't know if the information is is right, but it sounds right. And they did a hell of a job convincing me I should be on a plant-based diet. So I think there's these two pieces here with, you know, we want to get this information, but at the same time, even when I get it, I'm feeling like, well, I don't know if I should really tell anybody I'm doing it. Yeah, totally. And you've just delved into like, you know, one of the other big uh, domains of, of eating habits, which is like all of the stuff we have around eating, whether that's, you know, oh, do I have a history of dieting? Have I been, you know, so to speak, flavor of the month thing every month for the last 50 years? And my husband, wife, kids, friends are sick of me and my new diet fad. Mm. You know, that that's that's one thing. Or, or uh, you know, how do I feel about this? Is this something I, I could tell my family about? Are they going to want me to show up at the holiday dinner table and all of a sudden be like, oh, yeah, no, sorry, I can't eat that. You know, I've just decided that X, Y, Z food is evil. Like there's just, there's, you know, and as, as human beings, we have so many domains and dimensions of our lives that eating touches relationships, work, socializing, uh, planning, shopping, money. Like it really is embedded into almost every domain and dimension of our lives. So once we start changing things, there are knock on effects, like all throughout the entire complex system. So true. And I think especially if you do have a family or even just like, like I do, just me and my wife and myself, we, I always feel like, okay, I can't bring this in unless I do all the research and I'm going to go shopping and I'm going to learn these recipes. And there is so much that goes with it. It's crazy. Well, and here's the other piece of it too. So let's say that you, that, that let's just use, let's just pick on game changers because it's topical, right? So, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, I don't, I want to make it sound like I'm hating on plant-based diets or that yeah. I'm, you know, feel about them in any way, but let's, let's call it the topical flavor, you know, sure. uh, let's say that y- you do, um, you know, decide that this is the thing for you. Like this, this is entirely supportable by research. My God, the research case is compelling. Yeah. What if, you are one of the people for whom that research is not applicable because human diversity is so extensive. Uh, You know, human beings range in their ability to tolerate all kinds of foods. I mean, one example that comes to mind is garlic, right? Now, most of the time, garlic is like considered a superfood, right? It lowers your, your risk of cardiovascular disease and all this kind of stuff. But there are people out there who are allergic to garlic. So let's say I read all this research on garlic's beneficial health effects, and I'm like, wow, garlic sounds amazing. And then I go and eat garlic, and I go into anaphylactic shock, and I die, right? Yeah, I mean, that's just a little bit ridiculous. But, but you know, so I, I think this is the other piece of the puzzle, which is human individuality, whether that's biological individuality, life individuality, whatever. But even if we're just keeping it in the realm of the physiological, even if the research is awesome— it still may not apply to you. So even if you decide that a plant-based diet is absolutely the right choice and you're completely convinced, what if you try it and for whatever reason, it's a complete fail for you? Maybe you're intolerant to like half the foods that would be required, or maybe you can't get enough of some nutrient that you need or whatever, right? Um, There's lots and lots of factors that could affect your individual response to something, even if it is solidly evidence-based. So true. So Let's go into that. So really what, you know, you talk about like, what if it's not applicable? So that's where I think this idea uh, about this self-awareness piece, this, um, you know, sitting down and like you said, 
and thinking about it in in your book. And 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 so you kind of go through a bunch of questions. And in Why Me Want Eat, just so everybody knows, there's it's it's really like a workbook. So there's place to write and, and draw and doodle. Um, and so you could start to figure out some things that you're thinking about with this. And and I actually did something before this, before I started reading your book, a couple, uh, like last year. And what I started to notice was, I don't know, I didn't want to use the word relationship, but these associations with food. So, for example, I would, you know, go to a hockey game, like go down to the city and go to the Rangers game or something. And I always had this association with, having a drink beforehand, going inside, having, so, I always had to eat there, you know, and eat their food because it was part of the game, you know, um, or food as a reward for kind of, oh, you know, I'm home now and I had a tough day. And so, yeah, I can have this chocolate cake, whatever, or even for me, like going out, like uh, going in the afternoon, almost like afternoon tea, like I'll have a coffee and it's almost like, I got to have a cookie with that coffee in the afternoon. Not Meanwhile, I don't have it with my late morning coffee, but sometimes if I went somewhere, I felt like I can't just get a coffee. I got to get a coffee and a cookie. So I started to notice all of these associations. Um, and even one thing that was really kind of crazy for me is I started to notice that I was using a lot of times these the food to get out of things or delaying things like procrastinating. Like I'm going to do this right after I make this coffee and have that, you know, uh, that protein bar. Um, and it wasn't until I started to really like think about those things that I was able to change them. So talk to us about how you get people to sit down and think about it. Yeah, it's and as you're talking, you're telling these stories. I'm nodding and smiling, especially the delay. Like there is something, especially in that mid afternoon, uh, where I, I believe it is legally obligatory to have a cookie with your coffee at 3 p.m. <laughs> exactly. It's just it's just mandated, right? Yeah. And and it's so true. And and food is this like beautiful universal solvent of problem solving, right? Like it does so many things. It will dial the stimulation up, dial it down, it will distract you, it will refocus you, it will anesthetize you, it will entertain you, it will be your friend when you don't have any, like it is this really wonderful all-purpose thing. And, you know, in describing all these associations that we have with food, I'm, I'm really glad you brought it up because I hope that people listening understand that this is an almost entirely universal human phenomenon. So there are people out there that have zero associations with food that's like 1% of the population. Mm. Everyone else on some level has connections with food, whether that's, you know, food is my heritage, it's my identity as a insert person from whatever, you know, ethnic or, you know, geographic origin. Um, it connects me to my family. It connects me to the people around me. It's part of my day. It makes me feel better, whatever, right? All of us have emotional and, and cognitive associations with food. So that I think is is point number one. And so you may, you you bring up the self awareness piece, and I would actually argue that it goes beyond thoughts into feelings and sensations. So you know you talk about sitting down and thinking about it. I would also talk about sitting down and sensing in to it. Like what do you? feel like you want to do right now? Is your body trying to launch itself up out of the chair to go into your kitchen to go get something, right? Like there's a real kind of embodied spatiality to it, like the spaces of our homes. And I mean, it's interesting that the, the neurotransmitter dopamine we always think of it as like the reward chemical and people talk about like dopamine hit, right? Like all of a sudden we're, we're neuroscientists now and everyone's like dopamine hit, like they all know, <laughs> right? But, but dopamine is also involved in um, spatial orientation and movement. So, you know, part of the ritual for a lot of people is like where you are physically and how you are moving in your acquisition of food. And if if you think about it from an evolutionary perspective, it makes sense, right? Because the acquisition of food and the re rewardingness of food is involved with the going to get it, right? So there yeah. would be these kind of movement spatial elements to it. So, you know, again, part of going back and exploring those associations is what am I thinking? What am I feeling? What am I doing? And what do I want to do? Like, what does my body want to do? What do I find myself reaching for doing? Am I doing this secretively? Am I hiding? Does my body language say I'm, I'm hiding this, right? So definitely observe all of the things 
around what you're experiencing as part of the self-awareness project. Yeah, now that you just said that, one of the questions that I that I had answered in terms of, I think what you had asked was, um, there was a time when 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 are you not feeling? I think you know the monster for the most part, um, and for me it was when I was moving. And I'm, I have to be moving all the time, like either, you know, walking somewhere or going somewhere. And I felt like with me, it when I'm doing stuff, when I go, when I'm walking the dog, for example, a lot of times we'll go anywhere from two and a half to four to five miles. I'm not even I'm not hungry when I'm doing that. I'm not I'm not even thinking about it. Right. And when I'm doing these things, but then when I come back, if I'm in my office, there's this whole like you just said. I want to go over to the place to get fish tacos and I want to sit down and I want to see people because I'm in my office alone. So that's part of it, too, is that sometimes I just want to see people and I'm like, OK, what can I do instead of I might as well go get some fish tacos or go to this place and, and you know, see people. But for me, it's, it's interesting that that's that piece that you're talking about. There's this I'm going to go get my food. I'm going to go kill my food at the fish taco place and, and get it. But at the same time, there's other times when I'm moving and I'm I don't think about it because I'm I'm in and I don't need it. I don't feel like oh gotta have I gotta have food right now. Yeah, I think you're putting your finger on something so interesting. That I don't think we've fully apprehended in our culture these days because, you know, now we think of of movement as exercise, right? So like exercise is like a specific separate thing that we do or don't do. And we have to go to a specific facility to do this thing called exercise, right? Uh, yeah. Which, you know, we really don't have a concept culturally of how movement is such a human experience that we all require and that we also think with, right? We think with and through and in movement. So, you know, it makes complete sense that if movement is embedded in our lives in particular ways, it changes the direction of our thoughts and feelings as well. And in a way, we're almost thinking with our bodies. That's kind of how I look at it. And, you know, it's certainly not accidental that when human beings are trapped, you know, in, in sedentary lifestyles, of course, they would want to engage in activities that like alleviate the distress of kind of just being alive yeah. <laughs> in that state of affairs. So true. Um, now, this idea about feeling. So can you just go over because is is and you talk about slowly, even in, in your ebook, I think you put like, no, you know, eat slow. And then it said, yeah, I said eat slow. And then you put a, like a really big slowly. I said slowly. And, and so that's how important you feel like it is. Is that how you're able to, I don't want to say uh, teach people how to start feeling what they're feeling when they're eating or because I, want, I just want people to, um, you know, how they're noticing, you know, what they're eating and, and how they're feeling. Is that how you get clients to do it? Because everybody listening, obviously, there's either a strength coach or a personal trainer or um, somebody who's working with clients. So it seems like a hard concept to get people to to learn. And it's not like a food log. I guess it might be like a food log. But how do you do that? Yeah, well, I mean, the, the first thing we do it depends who I'm talking to. But uh, the first thing we do is. I like to frame it as a game or a challenge. Like, okay, I'll, I'll explain to you that eating slowly is a thing. Most people can understand the concept of eating slowly. I might describe specific ways to do it, like put your fork down between every bite, take a deep breath, and then pick your fork up again, or even, you know, wait a little bit longer. But like, make make putting the fork down and taking a breath like the minimum unit of time between bites. So I might describe specific ways to do it. But I will also frame it as a gamer experiment. And I'll say something like, listen, I know this sounds ridiculously simple. It sounds irritating. It sounds stupid. It sounds way too basic. Just humor me for like a week or even a day and try it like with full intent, full commitment, like really try to get into it and just try it and, and see what, if anything, changes for you. And I've had people go and do it even for like, a single meal. One woman told me a great story when I was teaching in Asia. I, so I, I gave some workshops in Asia to fitness trainers and I was telling them about eating slowly. And I was like, listen, go home tonight and just try it out and come back and report what happens. And so one woman tried it for breakfast 
And she made her kids the same breakfast. And and normally her breakfast is like a complete, you know, shitstorm of screaming kids and trying to get them to eat and rushing them out the door. So she's like, okay, forget all that. Let's just have a nice, calm, super slow breakfast. And so the first thing that happened was that her little kid said, mommy, did you make different eggs today? And she said, no, no, it's the same thing. He said, the eggs taste different today. So that's one piece of interesting data. The eggs taste different when eaten slowly. Mm. The second thing that happened was that her husband actually stuck his head out of his office uh, door and was confused because the kitchen was silent and calm. (laughs) He's used to yelling and screaming and frantic and tantrums and kids melting down. Um, So it changed the whole social dynamics of the meal too. So she came in that morning and said, I can't believe it. I'm completely sold on this slow eating thing. So, you know, telling people is one thing, but I always invite them to just try it. And I, and I, you know, I put on the table, like, listen, I know you're an advanced eater. Maybe you've competed in bodybuilding or you've cut weight for something. I totally get that this sounds so stupid. Just please humor me for like at least a day or two and really do try it. And, you know, 100% of the time, I haven't had a single person come back and say, yeah, you know what, there was no difference in any dimension of my experience. It's always transformative in some way. So now you're going to try it. That's a, I love, I love that. I love to just kind of, you know, almost like you're not, you're not tricking them, but just saying, look, just, just do this for me. Just please. I, I understand you're, you're that good at you. you you're experienced um, because we all, you do, we do have to be reminded of these things sometimes. And I think when you had some other, um, uh, not kind of rules, but some other ideas like, you know, notice when you eat, notice how fast, obviously, slowly, slowly is the best uh, with who you're eating. Where do you eat? Why do you eat? And then I was at first I was like, why do I eat? But then sometimes I started to think about that. And sometimes I feel like I just eat because, um, yeah, it's it's the morning. I'm supposed to eat. It's uh, it's lunchtime. I'm supposed to eat, you know, like um, I'm supposed to eat as opposed to eating, not eating when I was hungry. Right. Um, and only because, OK, my wife's coming home and, you know, when she gets home, that's what we do. We eat. Like, Are we even hungry when we do it? So I think there's there's so many of these other things. And could you just jump into a little bit more about how you eat trumps what you eat? Yeah. Well, OK, so this kind of leads in nicely from the slow eating. Right. And, and so I think people get so caught up in the what to eat. What should I eat? What should, you know, what, what don't I eat? What's good food? What's bad food? But we, that's like 10% really, I'm just, you know, pulling a number out of my ass on like what it is, but but really like there's so much around food that affects our digestion, uh, when we eat, how much we eat, uh, what we, like what foods we actually choose, how we experience them, you know, all of that stuff is so much more significant. Our experience of eating is so much more significant than the actual foods we choose because people don't eat nutrients, right? They don't eat calories. They eat meals and they eat meals in a context. So understanding the context and your experience that you're having in that context arguably is more important than the details of what you eat. Now, obviously the best case scenario is kind of you know, answering all those questions, what, why, when, where, how, with whom, whatever, you know, answering those in a way that's ideal. So best case scenario is having a very mindful and present choiceful experience while also eating foods that are nourishing and wonderful and good for you and improving your performance and all that kind of stuff. But the second thing tends to follow from the first thing. So the more we attune to the experience of eating and how we are in that and who we are showing up to that, the better our food choices tends to be. So like when you have that moment of awareness, like, okay, I'm now eating Doritos standing over the sink and I'm cramming them into my mouth. If we can pause and become aware of that and say, okay, is this who I want to, is this the experience that I want to have right now? You know, those food choices kind of change on their own a lot of the time. It's like, you know, there's this concept of like, things getting replaced in in habit change. And sometimes what happens in habit change is not so much that we choose to change things, but something else shows up that competes with it, right? So maybe we decide to take up running or we, I don't know, and it's fun and we like it, but now running is starting to compete with smoking, right? Maybe we smoked in the past and, and we never made the choice, oh, I'm gonna quit smoking, 
But now there's this thing that we love more, running, running with my dog. Maybe that's my new favorite thing. Well, now smoking is interfering with that, right? Yeah. So now we have a new positive pull in our lives that's starting to make the old thing just seem kind of like, eh, you know, I don't think I want this anymore. So the same thing is true of really focusing on how we eat in the experience. We, we start to kind of naturally be less interested in things that are not as good for us. Yeah. And, and, you know, now it's making much more sense with eating slower, because when you get this idea about being mindful, OK, when you're paying attention. So, OK, you said no eating at the desk or no eating, watching TV, which really also no kind of cell phone. Right. Uh, as well, like get the cell phone away from the from the plate because you're sitting there. And I, I have a tendency to do even as a kid, I used to eat cereal like one of my brother's friends always remarked to me, he's like, you're always reading like the back of the cereal box or the paper, or, you know, when you're eating cereal, what is that? You know, like, and, and it was always this other distraction um, while I'm doing it. And you like, so the, the fact, like when you get somebody to eat a lot slower, there, there, there's a better chance that they're going to notice what, when they're eating and, and, and what they're choosing to eat or, or, or you know, like understanding how they're eating or if they're eating, you know, too fast or uh, th they're going to get that taste. So I, I can understand now why the slow, slowly eating slowly is really kind of the gateway to, to all the other stuff. Well, and also too, what, what happens a lot is that when you eat a lot of kind of processed, like industrially created food, it doesn't taste good when you eat it slowly, mm. like go and try to eat a, a Dorito slowly it's going to be weird and sad and salty and kind of like soggy cardboard. Like it's not enjoyable. Don't Whereas talk if you eat about like, Doritos, like I know, I don't want to hating on Doritos. It's <laughs> I love Doritos actually personally, but um, you know, but if you eat something like a fresh in season strawberry or like a really high quality, good piece of chocolate and you let that chocolate dissolve in your mouth. I mean, it's just as good <laughs> five yeah. minutes in <laughs> as it was in the beginning. Right. So um, you know, when we improve the quality of our foods, uh, again, you know, a piece of fresh fruit or something like that, that we tend to enjoy them if we savor them. Whereas we find a lot of like cheapened foods just don't, don't hold up as well. So true. But so let's just go into, uh, the last couple of minutes here. I want to talk just from your perspective, uh, working with coaches, working with trainers uh, as well. Like, so people who are coaching, uh, um, other people. Um, and obviously you're head of the, the curriculum for precision nutrition. So you guys talk about this stuff. What are some of the mistakes that you feel like coaches and trainers are making with their clients that you would love to see people start to, okay, if you're going to be working with people in the very least, start to do these three things, for example. Well, you know, I think one of the biggest mistake is not understanding the fact that as a coach, you, you are the instrument of your own work, right? So you are the walking toolbox of, of your own work. And so what that means is you have to do a tremendous amount of work on your own mind and emotions and psychological well-being and emotional regulation and self-awareness. Like you have to be a much more psychologically developed developed human being um, than the average person to do this work. Because I, I think of being a coach as like being an, an emotional athlete or an interpersonal athlete. And so the requirement for your skill level in, in again, you know, mindset, psychology, uh, emotional self-awareness and regulation, um, all that stuff, interpersonal skills, communication skills, the bar for you is a lot higher than the average person. Because yeah. you have to be, you have to be on with your human body instrument, your reading body language, you're sensing into subtle cues and communication, you're looking for uh, visual cues that other people might miss, you know, s subtle shifts in conversational tone, um, handling difficult feelings, managing stress, all that stuff. So, you know, one of the big pieces is you got to handle your stuff. And, and that requires you having a support network. So, you know, get a counselor, get a therapist, get your own coach, get a mentor. Like you have to do that work in order to coach others effectively because clients will find every 
minefield that you have in yourself and they're not looking for it they'll, they'll usually stumble across it right they're not doing it on purpose but let's say you know a client comes in and they're like yeah listen um this this program you have me on i don't think it's working right so very innocuous statement now you're like oh my god they think i'm a bad coach oh that's it i'm a failure my mom was right i shouldn't have quit law school like you, you could conceivably <laughs> spiral down into this like you know massive negativity or panic or or whatever or or you know maybe they come in and they're having a bad day and you sense that and you get upset right and you can't calm yourself so you know there's all these aspects of coaching that people don't realize uh, are are part of the game so i think that's piece number 1 you have to handle your own shit before you can handle the client's shit basically now it doesn't mean you have to you know be the most psychically evolved human being before you can work with human beings you know we're <laughs> this yeah. work is never going to get done so yeah. you know try to get it good enough and then you know, have an ongoing cadence of of work on it um but definitely have people in your support network that you talk to about this work that you do because counselors and therapists work under supervision there's always someone that they go to to process the stuff that they hear in sessions so the same should really be true of a coach. Um, the second kind of related piece is that you are no different than your clients. So you are not a better human. You, um, you know, even though you have to be more psychologically advanced, you still have a, a real life where you want to eat potato chips. You want to crash out on the couch and watch Netflix. You're not getting your proper sleep. You're scrolling Instagram rather than going to bed. Like you're doing all of the same <laughs> things that your clients are doing. Right. Yeah. And so a lot of coaches worry like, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm not an, a, not a good enough person to coach clients, or I'm not ripped enough. I'm not in a good enough shape, or I've had these things that I'm grappling with. Well, the fact is that everything you grapple with is probably a human struggle. So if you look at your struggles as something that gives you tools in your coaching toolbox, that will really give you much more insight and empathy with your clients. So a lot of time, one of the things that happens is you get a lot of uh, younger coaches, especially who are working with middle-aged or older clients. And the younger coaches are really not sympathetic to, you know, balancing work and family or struggles with losing weight in an older body. They're like, yeah, man, just manage your macros or like whatever they're giving, whatever yeah. solution works for them and their 21 year old body. right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and the 51 year old is listening to this and like, okay, yeah, whatever. So, you know, in, in some ways you're the same as your clients, but also understand that, you know, you're going to be a little bit different, but, but over time you are going to face a lot of the same things that your clients face. So everything that you deal with, every struggle that you have, use that as an opportunity to gain insight and empathy and connection with your client. So your clients aren't looking for you to be perfect. They're looking for you to be genuine and capable of forming an authentic connection, um, of honesty between you. So now the flip side of that is you don't want to be vomiting all your problems on your client every day, yeah. but you know, be a human being in your coaching practice rather than trying to be some kind of perfect two dimensional Instagram icon. Cause that's not what your clients come for most of the time. So true. And you know, Krista, just to finish up, I, I, my, um, in my book, be like the best. I had so a lot of I've been on a lot of podcasts and they've been asking me, you know, what are what are some things what are something that you've kind of come up learned or gotten from people? And one of the things that I've been saying is you really have to be intentional about this. And and by being intentional, I mean, you know, you have to sit down and write out, think about your mission and purpose and and then and think about the life that you want to live and and think about what are your values and then the some of the when you start to figure those things out you will um the rest will fall into place so the goals that you have that you start to write down will will reflect those things too and this really reminds me of this and 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 that's why i think your book why me want eat is so important because you give people the space to start to figure out those things like for us to become a little bit more evolved than our, our our clients and and start to figure that out on our own too about ourselves so we can have a better way to talk to talk to people about this and and understand them a little bit more and and then also you know like you said give ourselves a, a break when um when we're thinking about this that we're struggling with this as well well, and I'm glad you said that because I really think there's no quality in coaching more critical than compassion. Yeah. 
whether that's for yourself or for someone else. I mean, there's just this incredible healing power um, of compassion that, you know, when you offer it to yourself or you offer it to someone else, like something just shifts so powerfully uh, in people's experience of the situation. So even if they, you know, aren't ready to change or they haven't arrived at any good solution, like somehow just being offered compassion is like a magical thing. It's like, you know, when you're a little kid and you skin your knee and you're holding it together until you get home. And then you, your mom is like, Oh baby, you fell and skinned your knee. You're like, I know I fell down. <laughs> like it, just, it kind so of just true. releases all this stuff inside you. Right. Yeah. So, um, it, it really is such a critical, uh, capacity. I mean, there's other skills obviously, but it, everything has to begin with compassion and asking yourself, you know, what are people grappling with? What are they? Su- how are they suffering? What pain are they experiencing? Um, what is their story, and kind of how does it make sense? It it opens up so many more possibilities than starting with like, oh, my clients are lazy and unmotivated, and they're really frustrating me, and they don't do the things that makes me mad. Like you know, that that conversation doesn't go anywhere. Whereas if I begin with like, oh man, my client has been hitting the chocolate hard this week. Like, I wonder what's going on for them. They must be dealing with some stuff. Let's explore that. I mean, it just opens things up so much more. Absolutely. Well, Krista, thank you so much for doing this. I want to remind everybody, uh, we'll have a link to Why Me Want Eat. It's a really great way to start to understand and gain some self-awareness about your own habits and your own relationship um, and associations with 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 food and with eating. So, um, Krista, thanks so much for coming on and uh, talking to us all about this. Oh, I'm glad I could. This was a fun time. All right, that's going to do it for episode 269 of the Strength Coach Podcast. Remember, you can try strengthcoach.com out for three days. Just a buck, you'll have access to all the articles, videos, and programs, as well as the best forum on the net. It's the only place to have full access to Coach Boyle. He's on every day. To access that offer, go to strengthcoach.com. Click the Join Now button to get started on your trial. Special thanks to Chris Parrier and the folks over at Perform Better right now. Perform Better, huge summer sale, up to 30% off, so many items. Free shipping on select items. There's sandbags, FMS kits, TRX, all kinds of rollers, kettlebells, dumbbells, and more. Check it out at performbetter.com. Thanks to Coach Boyle and Krista Scott Dixon for sharing their insights and philosophies into the world of strength conditioning and performance enhancement and nutrition. Thanks to Adam Doughty, Tim Robinson, and Train Heroic. Head over to trainheroic.com, start your free 14 day trial. Let them know I sent you. You'll save 10% off your first year of the Train Heroic Pro or Elite Edition. A last scar for the Results Fitness University Business of Fitness segment. Check them out at resultsfitnessuniversity.com. Jenna Gourlay and Functional Movement Systems. Check them out at functionalmovement.com. My name is Anthony Rana. My new book, Be Like the Best, is at belikethebest.com, or you can just go to continuefit.com. The book is 50 interviews with top fitness pros, and after each interview, is a be like, which is just an action step or a challenge that'll help you be like the best. You can also get the be like the best workbook, which has room for notes and all kinds of space to answer the questions. So remember, go to be like the best.com or continuefit.com. That's going to do it for today. Thanks again, and I'll speak to you next time.